Yeah, you're on as the pastor on TCT's network. I'm your host, Pastor Michael Gamble, and we want to welcome you to today's program. We want to thank you for joining us, and we want to thank you for partnering with us in giving, sowing, and allowing us to do what we do all over the United States. Uh, so TCT has a day of prayer on Tuesday, April the 30th, and I want to ask you, do you need healing? Do you need God's intercession for a loved one? Do you want God's power released in your life? If this describes you, if these questions describe you, please call in your prayer request at 1-800-232-9855 so we can pray for you and your specific needs on the TCT Day of Prayer on Tuesday, April the 30th. And that's coming up faster than you think, and I'm excited about it. Also, this program doesn't exist without your questions. So any question, regardless of how ridiculous or simple you may think it is, is welcomed here on the program. Ask your question. Email us at ask at tct.tv. Call us at 1-800-331-3552. Or ask in the comments section of Facebook or YouTube. And right now, without further ado, I want to introduce our panel of pastors. Today we have Pastor Nancy Columbus of the Awakening Church in Akron, Ohio. Great to have you today. We have Dr. Booker Person, no stranger to you, of Greater Bethel Baptist Church in Akron, Ohio. Grateful to have you on today's program. We have Bishop Demetrius Davenport of Village Culture Christian Church in Dearborn Heights, Michigan, up by the lakes. We're glad you're here. And we have Pastor Tyrone Edwards of Central Missionary Baptist Church in Savannah, Georgia, down where the weather is warm. Grateful to have you on today's program as well. Well, the first question is coming from the great state of California. And Raymond is asking, how can we debunk the science version of creation? And that, pa that is going to Pastor Nancy Columbus. But before it does, I just want to say, do you think that the science version he's talking about is evolution? Do you think, because uh, I don't believe that science does debunk our version of Christianity. I don't believe that they're incompatible, but I think when most people refer to the scientific account of creation, they're referring to the evolution, the account of evolution, the theory. We don't want to just call it a evolution. We can call it the theory of evolution since none of us were there to observe it. Pastor Columbus. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm going to bypass the, the evolution part of this, but I am going to explain um, Genesis 1 uh, verses 11 through 16. And they uh, make it clear that God created the heavens and the earth and everything in it. So when we look at science, God created science. All and you know, this is the thing that I um, I saw today when when you asked this question. You know, when He created human beings, He did something different. He made us from the dust of the ground uh, to form man, but He breathed His own life into us, uh, making man a living soul. And in doing so, making us into His image, He gave us everything everything we needed to understand uh, not only the Word of God, but He gave us um, the knowledge and the wisdom to be able to understand some of creation and the science that was behind it, the moon and the stars and, and the things in the sky and the things that are on the earth. Um, I think that Somehow we've taken it a little too far. Um, I don't think that we need to know some of the things that we've gone, that some of the people have, you know, gone into uh, like CERN and some of the things that are going on today. But God has been clear that he is the creator. Nothing existed except for what he created. So he is the one that we point to when it comes to science, when it comes to anything on the this earth and beyond. So good, thank you, Pastor Nancy. Dr. Booker Person, I wanna ask you the same question. And this is a question that relates to 
apologetics and the defense of our faith. We've got to be ready in season and out to defend our faith. And Raymond wants to know how can he defend the version, the biblical version of creation against what mainstream colleges and universities and even high schools are teaching here in the United States? Well, thank you. Uh, that is a great question. And uh, Pastor Columbus has really uh, laid it out for us. Um, we, we contend for the faith in that we believe, first of all, that God is the creator and the sustainer of everything, that the world, uh, he spoke it into existence. Um, we, at the sound of his word, the Bible also says, in, of course, in the first uh, chapter of John, and in the beginning was the word, and the word was God, and the word was with God, and the word was God. And um, without him, was, there, was, there was nothing made without him. And so as it relates to science, um, we thank God for uh, scientific um, uh, theories. Uh, however, we do know that the earth is the Lord's, and we stand firmly on that, the fullness thereof of the world and they that dwell therein. Everything evolves but God, and so everything comes from God, and so I am a firm believer in the fact that um, God uh, created it all, and uh, we have to be very mindful, and uh, those who want to worship science, uh, that uh, they're going in the wrong direction. Amen. Thank you, Dr. Person. When asked the same question, Raymond in California is asking, how can we debunk the science version of creation? Bishop Davenport, what do you think? Well, Raymond, thanks for the question. Pastor, thanks for Pastor, giving me the opportunity to speak to it. So um, like anything, something can't be debunked by people or two people who don't want to debunk. So as the pastor was saying, we use faith. But you can look at science and the most common theories on creation, like the Big Bang Theory, and they fail science's own requirements. Uh, everything in the natural universe requires, as I, as I was told and understood, a continuum. You need time, space, and matter. All three of these things must be present in order for something to be born. Big Bang says, out of nothing, something happened. But based off scientific principle alone, that's not possible. Something had to have something had to have begun before that began. So as, as the Big Bang goes, um, something out of nothing doesn't happen. So science debunks its own version of creation. The only thing that makes sense is faith. Uh, time, space, matter. I think Pastor Nancy just mentioned the Bible refers to, it says plainly, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In that statement, there is time, space, and matter for that the, uni the physical universe to be born by a God who does not exist in time. Time exists because of God. Uh, a God who does not exist by matter because God created matter. And God does not create space because all the space is in God. So again, science debunks its own theory based off what it says. Yes, I appreciate that. We had to have something outside of what you said, time, space, and matter, the continuum, in order to provide us with something within time, space, and the creatio ex nihilo, creation out of nothing, just as you said. So good. Uh, Pastor Tyrone Edwards, I, just, I want to ask you again, because this is such an important question. So many of our kids that are going to biology class are learning something different than we're teaching in our Sunday school class. And they're coming home to their parents and their grandparents with these questions. How do I reconcile these things? Uh, there are some people that might be out there saying that the biblical account of creation is a parable or an analogy. Or, or there might be some saying that God used evolution to create the world. And then there's others say, let's take it at face value. The scripture says it. That settles it. This is an account of history. This isn't an allegory. Where do you land on this? I land with God. 
as long as we land with God, then everything else it's in in, in and of itself it doesn't it matters, but it's a matter of faith, if you will. The struggle that we have is getting our children to understand that as human beings, we have there's nothing that we have taken where it's nothing and created anything. If I try to grab air, I cannot grab air because air is, if you will, invisible. We can see air blowing in a balloon or what have you, but I cannot grab air. I cannot, as a human, we cannot take anything. We cannot take nothing and, and create anything. God himself spoke everything into existence and he took nothing and made something. He formed us in his image. And the question that I always ask people who say, you know, who deal with evolution is, if we evolved then and we had tales from the beginning or what have you, then why are we not still, if you will, evolving from a standpoint of grow, st growing um, other limbs or other entities or what have you? The, the, the struggle that we have to uh, admit is that God created it through his word, through speaking it, and we have to have that faith that he did it for all of us. And once we agree that God has done it, then we have to stand on that principle that God did it for God did it to show each and every one of us which way to go and how we should go. Amen. Amen. And I, I just want to add, I think that God gave us signs in the heavens. Was so good, Pastor Tyrone. But I believe that God gave us signs in the heavens. Many of the uh, people in the population of the United States watched the eclipse that just happened. And I think if we look up and we look around us, we see the signature of God in all of creation. And we know that the sun is exactly 390 times the distance that the moon is, and that the sun is 390 times greater than the moon is. Out of 290 some moons in the galaxy, the, the Milky Way, the, which is where we live when we reside, there is only one that is perfectly matched to provide us with the lunar eclipse, solar eclipse that we just had, actually, where we see that corona right around the moon. And even atheists have suggested that they struggle with the infinitely difficult question, how is this possible? It is absurdly improbable, if not for divine design. That's what I call divine design. And if you're watching and you want to study this out further, I encourage you to check out the book by Lee Strobel called Case for a Creator, where he uh, explains where some of these laws are so infinitely uh, improbable without a intelligent designer. And uh, I, I encourage you, we don't have a lot of time in the program to stay on this, but that will help you get a start in what you need to know and where you need to go. Because uh, a funny thing is, the, according to the law of infinite probabilities, this income, this, these big universe generators that are pumping out these, these solar systems and planets and stars, uh, you should be able to throw your laundry in the, in the dryer every once in a while, and they should come out folded according to the law of infinite probability. But we all can laugh at that, can't we? Because that's never happened for me. <laughs> Anyways, we got a question. We, got a need to, we need to keep moving. William is asking, why do Christians have to forgive people who don't ask for it? This is a great question. Uh, Dr. Booker Person, the question, why do Christians have to forgive people who aren't even asking for it? Yes, it is a, a relevant question. Um, and it's always uh, one I think about, uh, we, we hear, to err is human, but to, to forgive is divine. And uh, when we study our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, uh, the word is clear in what we call the model prayer or the disciples' prayer. It's tag the Lord's prayer where, where we pray, um, forgive us our debts as we forgive those that sin against us. Um, and it's so important if we want forgiveness, then we have to be willing to give forgiveness. Uh, there are those points in our lives when it becomes uh, a challenge when people do us any kind of way. But in the end, uh, 
you you forgive others and you free yourself. And I know all of us want to be free so that we can continue to lift up the Lord Jesus Christ and bring glory to his name and to the kingdom. And so we must all be mindful that uh, we should be willing to forgive others if we want forgiveness. The same way we forgive others is the same way the Lord can forgive us. So good. Matthew chapter 6, right out of the Lord's Prayer. That's exactly what you're talking about. He said, if you forgive others, your Heavenly Father will forgive you. And if you do not forgive others, your Heavenly Father will not forgive you. And that is worth our attention, that our salvation is really resting upon our ability to receive and release forgiveness simultaneously. Bishop Demetrius Davenport, I got a question, same question. William, why do Christians have to forgive people when they're not even asking for it? Let me ask you further. Oh, go ahead. Well, I apologize. You guys have really just nailed the answer to me. I just want to raise the text from the King James Version to what you just said, Luke chapter 6. I'm going to begin reading at verse 35. It says, But love your enemies and do good and lend, hoping for nothing again. For your reward shall be great, and you shall be the children of the highest, for he is kind unto the unthankful and to the evil. Be ye there merciful, as the Father also is merciful. Judge not, you shall not be judged. Condemn not, you shall not be condemned. Forgive, and you shall be forgiven. We have to, we have to forgive those that didn't ask for it for all the reasons stated by our host and brother pastor, because we are told to do so. That's the reality of it. It is a commandment given by the Lord. Now, being obedient to the word and the will of God yields us all type of benefits, right? We should also be forgiven. Yeah. Uh, it separates us from the world. It, it frees us from the bondage of the stress of trying mm. to remember why we're mad at people. There's all these other benefits that come from it. But to your question, uh, William, we forgive those who didn't ask for it because forgiveness is greater than us and bigger than them. We forgive mm. because we were forgiven. We forgive because we've been pardoned. We forgive because we know what it's like to fall and not just get up, but be picked up. And because we know what that's like, we extend that same love to other people. Wow, that's so good, Bishop Davenport. And we're going to get more into this question in just a moment and others coming up. When a person is speaking in tongues, is God speaking to just that person? Or to the congregation, lots more live questions coming in after this short break. Stay with us. Are you seeking a closer relationship with the Lord? Could it be you're looking for comfort in the midst of life's challenges? Or maybe you need a miraculous intervention in your life. This month, TCT is inviting you to experience the wonderful power of prayer. And we have some amazing gifts that will help you do just that. The 18th chapter of Matthew contains one of the greatest teachings on the power of prayer in all of Scripture. For your gift of any amount in April, we're excited to bless you with this outstanding set of Matthew 18 prayer cards. These 12 inspiring cards will draw you closer to God and to the body of Christ as you pray for family, friends, our nation, and the world. These fabulous Matthew 18 prayer cards can be yours with a gift of any amount in April. But that's not all. For your gift of $45 or more, you'll also receive the incredible book, Learn to Pray, 66 Bible Prayer Passages Explained and Applied. This power-packed 96-page prayer resource will help you become familiar with effective prayer and deepen your relationship with the Heavenly Father. Learn to pray, and the Matthew 18 prayer cards are yours with your gift of $45 or more this month. But we're still not done. For your generous gift of $250 or more, we'll also send you this cozy renewal blanket. As you spend time with God, you can wrap yourself in the warmth of His Word, as well as the warmth of this exclusive renewal blanket. It's all yours, along with the Matthew 18 prayer cards and the Learn to Pray book for your gift of $250 or more this month. At the TCT Network, we know the life-changing power of prayer firsthand. Today, we're sending the gospel message out to more people in more homes than ever before. None of this would be possible without your prayers and financial support. As our special thank you, we would love to help enhance your prayer life with these powerful gifts. To receive yours, call 1-800-232-9855 or go to tct.tv today. 
If you'd like to partner with us and send in your love gift, you can do that by visiting our website, www.tct.tv, by calling us at 1-800-232-9855. Or if you don't know already, you can scan the QR code provided on your screen by just lifting up your cell phone, opening up your camera app, and that will give you additional ways to donate. If you have questions, as many of you have, Joseph, Victoria, Bonnie, and Michael are all asking live questions that we're going to get to in just a moment. And you can email us at askattct.tv. Call us at 1-800-331-3552. And ask in the comments section right there if you're watching on social media, on Facebook or YouTube. Okay, this is the last uh, person I'm going to address the second question of the day. But it's an important one. It's essential to our faith, and I believe that there's somebody out there right now who needs to forgive somebody, and as Bishop said, it may be for their benefit, not the person they're forgiving, but it's actually benefiting us by forgiving. I loved his answer. Pastor Tyrone, I want to ask you, how do we forgive, and what does that look like? Does forgiveness mean that you ought immediately reconcile with the person who harmed us, hurt us? Do we just throw out the boundaries that we need? Let me ask you that, Pastor Tyrone. Thank you for the question. So how do we, the question you ask is how do we forgive? We forgive because the way that we forgive is knowing that Christ forgave us. The Bible says while we were yet sinners, Christ died for our sins. While we were still in the midst of doing wrong, Christ was still looking out for us. And the way that we forgive people is, in the, even in the midst of their, their sin or even in the midst of them doing stuff against us, we, we say a prayer and ask God to soften, soften our hearts. Because if God softens our hearts, then we're able to, uh, as God did, look beyond our faults and look beyond our neighbor's faults and see their need. They may need forgiveness because they don't know how, the only thing that they know how to do is hurt people because we know hurt people hurt people. Hurt people. Yeah. So, so if we forgive, if we tell them that we forgive them, uh, Paul talks about hum, having heaps of coal uh, over, over their heads. That means that we're going to provide them with <laughs> comfort and with a love that they may not even know that they need at the time. And so we forgive by continuously to love them. It doesn't mean that you go back to get hurt again. It means that you love them. Sometimes you have to love people from a distance and you love them from a distance, letting them know that, guess what? God loves me. He loves me up close because I have the power of the Holy Spirit. And I'm going to get closer and closer to you as you realize that I'm loving on you as opposed to loving against you. Mm, so good. So we don't, we don't forfeit the boundaries for those that continue to abuse us and, and are, are offending us continually. We, we, but we can reconcile without, uh, or we can forgive without reconciliation. It's a decision, not a feeling. So good. Thank you, Pastor Tyrone. That was wonderful. This is the lightning round. We're going to get into a lot of these questions. We're going to get into them fast right now. Pastor Nancy Columbus, Joseph's asking, was Nicodemus born again? Well, I believe that Nicodemus um, did, in fact, get born again. You know, um, the Word of God says that he, in uh, John 3, 1, he describes Nicodemus as a leader of the Jews, and um, he was a member of the Sanhedrin. So, you know, he was part of the ruling body of the Jews. Now, when he has a conversation with Jesus in John 3, 3, Jesus tells him that he has to be born again, and he doesn't understand what that means. But Jesus explains to him what it means to be born again. And I believe that he did get born again, because when you go further into the scripture, um, the scriptures in John, it talks about how Nicodemus stood up for Jesus. And then it, it goes on, um, you know, at, um, in John 19, after Jesus's crucifixion, we find that Nicodemus was assisting Joseph of Arimathea and um, in Jesus's burial. And Joseph is described as John as a rich man in, in Mark 15, 43, as a member of the council. So he, I believe that he was born again. And I believe that he became a, a, a follower of Jesus, despite um, the role that he had to play, you know, in the government. I believe 
I, I personally, I believe that he fell in love with Jesus at the end of the day. Pastor Nancy, you nailed that question, hit the ball right out of the park, and I, I couldn't agree with you more. So we're just going to jump right into the next question, and thank you so much. And Victoria is asking, why did they say Stephen went to sleep in Acts 7 and verse 60 instead of saying that he died? Dr. Person. Well, first of all, we, we, when we get to the Acts uh, account there, uh, he was stoned to death, and of course, um, when 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 we look at that passage, we see how heaven is involved. Uh, the son of the son of God, Jesus, uh, uh, stood up on the right hand of of the Father, and uh, we often say that that person is. Uh, at rest or just resting. Um, so the, the the scripture says that he fell asleep and that simply means that he died. So it's not uh, uh, any more than that. It does mean that he uh, left this uh, mortal body and entered into uh, immortality. Thank you for that clarification, Dr. Persa. Uh, Bishop Davenport, at funerals and, and uh, memorial services, often we read a scripture in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and it says something, these are not dead as you suppose, they are merely asleep, and then it talks about the coming of the Lord, and it says, wherefore comfort ye one another with these words, what is, what is the meaning of spiritual death and spiritual life? as opposed to an earthly death or, 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 or earthly living. Great. Thanks for teeing that up, Pastor. Um, it's, 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 it's temporal, and then there's eternal. Uh, mm. I want to read because the, the, the caller referenced particular scripture, so I just want to read the scripture. Again, I'm reading from the King James Version, Acts 7, verse 60, says, And he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he said this, he fell asleep. So mm. uh, as Dr. Persons uh, uh, alluded to, it's more of a polite way to say that, you know, mm. instead of saying he died, it, he went to sleep. Now, Pastor Gamble, you really, you really opened that up for us because people who are not saved, who are not in the knowledge of Jesus Christ, think that death is final. But as believers, we know we're going to rise again, and not only rise again, we're going to live again. We're going to live eternally with our Heavenly Father and our Lord and Savior uh, under His rule. Well, while everyone will rise again, those who mm. do not accept Jesus Christ will live a life of pain and torment. Those who have accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior will live a life of peace. Uh, so uh, sleep as they know it, or death as they know it, is not the complete picture. It's not the complete idea. It's not the complete mm. process. There's more to life and death with Jesus than there is without him. Come on with that, Bishop. I appreciate that answer. It's so good. And thank you, Dr. Person, as well. Uh, we want to keep moving. I told you this is the lightning round. So Bonnie's asking right now, coming to you, Pastor Tyrone, why was heaven referred to as Abraham's bosom? Or is that something different altogether? So thank you, Heather, for your question. Uh, Luke 16 uh, around that 22nd verse says, so it was that the beggar died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. Uh, Abraham's bosom is that intimate relationship that we have with God. Now that picking up where we left off with, with the sleep, once we go to sleep, we are now in Abraham's bosom, or we now have that intimate, we're able to have that intimate relationship with God because we're no longer constrained by this physical body. We're now in our spiritual body and we can be with the Lord. Once we um, rise again or what have you, we, we're going to rise with the Lord as long as we have faith and believe in him. Abraham's bosom is that place of comfort, that place of promise that God has promised to each and every one of us who believe in him. And so when we look at the question of um, why was Abraham's bosom, if you will, why was heaven referred to Abraham's bosom? It is that intimacy, is that relationship that we're going to have with God when we live forever and ever. 
Yeah, thank you so much, Pastor Tyrone. And I want to ask the same question of Pastor Nancy. Uh, when we are looking at this term, Abraham's bosom, uh, some people would conflate this with the word purgatory. And do you believe that this, this territory in the spiritual realm existed for Old Testament purposes? And was it uh, then discontinued in New Testament times? Or do you believe that it's still in use in operation today? Well, I don't believe that there is a place that's literally called purgatory. Um, some religions do believe that, but I do believe that you know, the lake of fire and Hades are two different places, and those that die and are separated from God will be in Hades until the day of judgment, and then they will be thrown into the lake of fire along with Satan. Um, being in Abraham's bosom is not being separated from God, um, but I be but I also believe that there's going to be a new heaven and there's going to be a new earth. So I believe that when we die, it's like we fall asleep and we wake up in the presence of the Lord, um, which would be considered heaven in this question. Mm, thank you, Pastor Nancy. And some people would even contend that Abraham's bosom was a holding place for saints that weren't ready to return to heaven because Jesus hadn't been, his blood did not provide us with atonement or propitiation yet. And so uh, when you look at it, it says that many rose from the dead. It is believed that their spirit was coming out of Abraham's bosom and some, instead of moving into the heavenly places, were actually, they went back, transitioned back into their bodies and came out of the ground with Jesus. You look at the scripture, it says that many came in that time. Uh, the next question, because I told you this is the lightning round. We're moving quick as I've got word from the back. It said, we got more questions, lots of live questions. And that's a great thing. Michael, you've got a great name, and you're asking, was wearing sackcloth only for the Jewish people? Bishop Davenport. Actually, sorry, well, this is going oh, to Dr. This is going to Dr. Person first, and I messed up. Forgive me. Yes. Um, sackcloth. Um, and, uh, the Jews, it was a custom of theirs that whenever they... Um, someone died or if they wanted to uh, be serious with God about their uh, sins, they would go down in sackcloth. Um, so it was a Jewish custom. I would say even today that it should be uh, a, a time where we uh, seek the Lord, uh, not necessarily with uh, Ashes, we have uh, Ash Wednesday that uh, many uh, uh, face practice, uh, but uh, there should be a, a, a time of uh, fasting and, and prayer. Um, and so um, as far as you take that, uh, you may, but uh, as we want to make sure that we do uh, get serious with God. Amen. Amen. And, and Bishop Davenport, it's a good thing we talked about forgiveness earlier because you had to forgive me and Dr. Booker had to forgive me for skimming him and scaring you. <laughs> no, uh, the question today is from Michael, was wearing sackcloth only for Jewish people or uh, are there people that when they're in mourning or maybe they're in fasting that they should wear sackcloth and ashes today? But you're so kind to keep teeing these up for me. Uh, so, yeah, the Jewish custom was to wear sackcloth, uh, but that's no different than other customs and other religions, other races, uh, other ethnicities. Uh, in the American church, uh, across the spectrum, uh, the homegoing services, we adorn black, right? Uh, there's no different than uh, the sackcloth garb in, 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 the, in the way that it identifies a mourning or a sorrowful situation. It is a way to show respect. And for the Jewish custom, it was a little different because it was really a way to seek God. It was a way to let people know, hey, I'm in this situation. I'm going through this, whatever may be deaf. It may be something uh, personal, but hey, uh, I, I, I'm in almost in a fasting state where I'm seeking God. So I need to be separate a little bit. And I had that kind of that connotation to it as well. Uh, so it wasn't just for the Jews, no, but it was a practice that they uh, really own and still do today to a lot of, a lot of degree. Uh, with that, again, other 
religious nationalities have similar customs. So if someone asks if you can wear sackcloth, you can, but you don't have to. A repentant heart to the Lord really yields the same result, right? Uh, a loving memory of a deceased one, thanking God for the experience of having them in your life. These are acceptable as well, spiritually. Thank you so much, Bishop. And, and in just a moment, we're going to answer questions from Josephat, uh, Michelle, and Elaine. And some of those questions are, how many times can you be saved again if you backside, backside to sin? And others coming right up. Don't go anywhere. We'll see you in just a moment. Did you know you can enjoy total Christian television, whether at home or on the go, all with one simple click? Watch TCT's exclusive live stream and on-demand programming. Cast to your smart TV. Share episodes with your friends. Never miss a moment of your favorite programs with pause and rewind. Just for signing up and downloading the TCT app, we'll send you a great gift absolutely free. Selection will vary and supplies are limited, so don't wait another minute. Go to tct.tv to get started. Download the TCT app to get access to Total Christian Television. Do it today. ask the questions, and we provide the answers. On Ask the Pastor, we minister the Word of God as we receive your inquiries. It takes a great deal of time, effort, and finances to produce this quality Christian programming. When you support TCT, we can continue to provide biblical Christian guidance to our viewers. By renewing our mind, we are literally transformed. So it's okay to ask questions, and it's okay to be honest with God. Your support can make a difference in the lives of many. Go to our website at tct.tv or call us at 1-800-232-9855. You can text to give by sending TCT to 56512. Or you can mail a contribution to P.O. Box 1010, Marion, Illinois, 62959. Thank you for partnering with TCT and Ask the Pastor. Hey, if you love this program as much as we love you, consider partnering with us and showing your support by donating today on our website, www.tct.tv. Call us at 1-800-232-9855 or scan the QR code for additional ways to donate. And you might say, how in the world do you love me? You never even met me. Well, because I'm praying for you. You are made in God's image, and I love God's creation. He has never made a mistake. You're not one. And I know that God is using this program to bring inspiration and illumination to your life. And with that said, if you want more inspiration and illumination, ask your question Email us at ask at tct.tv. Call us at 1-800-331-3552 or ask in the comments section right there on Facebook or YouTube. All right, Joseph Fat, you've called and you're asking how many times can you be saved again if you backslide to sin? And I'm coming to Pastor Tyrone, I believe. All right. How many times can you be saved again if you backslide to sin? I would direct you to 1 John uh, 1, uh, verse 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. God will remove the stain of sin every time that we backslide, if we come to him and confess. Uh, the disciples asked Jesus, how many times shall we forgive our brother? Jesus said, 70 times seven. If God is telling us to forgive 70 times seven, then how many, how many times can he forgive us if we continue to sin? Again, I go back to while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. God mm. absolutely promises to, promises to forgive us, and he consistently wants to forgive us. The key is we have to accept God's gift, but we have a responsibility ourselves to say, okay, Lord, take this away from me. Now, we have to also determine, should God not take this away from you? Is this your thorn in the side to make sure that you keep running to God? 
the choice we have to make, we have to understand. One, is this something that I'm purposely doing or is this something that God keeps keeps there for me so that I can make sure that I stay connected to him and stay dependent upon him? God wants to forgive your sins. Verse John 1 and 9 says so. Mm, I love what you revealed about the nature of God as you're telling us. You said he didn't just say give, forgive 70 times seven a day, uh, 70 times seven times in your whole life. He said a day. I mean, it, so if God is instructing us to do something. We know that he doesn't instruct us or command us to do something that's not in his own nature. And we thank God for that. It's so good. And Pastor Nancy, I want to ask you the same question because somebody's probably watching and they're saying, I have a struggle with drugs. I have a struggle with an online addiction. I've got a sexual addiction that I'm trying to come out of. Me and my boyfriend or girlfriend, we keep messing up and we're trying. Is my salvation at risk? That's what they're really, that's, a, that's another way of asking that question. And what would you tell them? Is there salvation at risk? Can they be forgiven? Well, Joseph, Ed, I just want to say that, you know, the question, how many times can you be saved? Um, we are saved once and once and for all. When we receive Jesus Christ into our hearts and we, we give our lives to him and we repent of our sin and we decide that we are going to follow his ways, then we, are, we have salvation and that doesn't get taken away from us when we sin. Now, can we backslide? Absolutely, because we are all sinners and God knows it. And that's why, you know, and my answer to that question about sackcloth, yeah, the, the Jews still feel that they may need sackcloth in order to, to um, be forgiven. But we have Jesus Christ who died on the cross um, for our sins so that we can repent and we can be repentant we are forgiven. And, you know, that doesn't mean that we're not going to backslide or sin, but we have the Holy Spirit that he has also imparted in us to help us to stay away from that sin. So if we're in prayer, if we're in the word of God, and we love God with all of our heart, soul, and mind, I think we can turn away from that sin. And yes, we may fall short of the glory once in a while, but we do not have to live a life of sin. If you're doing something on a continual basis, I would say stop. And through yeah. the power of the Holy Spirit, you can do that when you repent and you make up your mind that you're going to turn from your wicked way because God has made a way through Jesus Christ. Yeah, thank you so much. And just because this is such a, a very important, that was a great answer, from all of our pastors, we just had phenomenal answers today. Uh, because this is such an important question for people that are wrestling with their eternal destination, uh, Dr. Person, is it true if our name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life, can it be blotted out? Is there a difference between stumbling in sin and staying in sin? Thank you. It, it certainly is a difference. Uh, the the, the born-again believer uh, and the uh, passage that was shared with us earlier in 1 John uh, chapter 1, verse 9, the born-again believer does not go on living uh, a life of sin as a lifestyle. That's no longer our lifestyle. So there is a difference in a, in, in a, in a stumble. Um, and uh, he continues in chapter 2 by saying, uh, a little children, I write these things unto you that you sin not. So sin not, that, that's the standard that he doesn't want us to sin. But if any man sin, we have an advocate, Jesus Christ, the righteous, who is the propitiation for our sins, and not only our sins, but the sins of the world. And and I, there's a picture that I always remembered uh, uh, that's, that he, he gets rid of our sins. He pitches them out. And so we can praise God for the whole uh, unlimited forgiveness. That is awesome that he, he has enough grace for us. Paul said, more sin, more grace. Mm. And so we can be encouraged to know that uh, he wants us, the standard is not to sin, but if Amen. we do sin, 
he, he's already taking care of that also. Thank you for that clarification and walking in the balance for those that are that are wondering and questioning uh, right now. Thank you so much. Uh, I told you this is a lightning round. We got so many live questions because time is short. I got to keep moving. But if you want the same question on a future program, go ahead and ask again to get more insight, more revelation. You're welcome to do that. Michelle, you're watching right now. We thank you for your question, Michelle. And Bishop Davenport, this question is, how do we as children of God stand firmly in his promise, his love and reward after divorce? So many people have been hurt by the grief of divorce and uh, some people didn't even want divorce. Uh, th there's numerous reasons why people get divorced, and sometimes uh, they were divorced, not they didn't write the divorce. Or, or So how, what would you say to Michelle, who's watching right now? Michelle, let me first uh, say to you that I'm going to be praying for you, uh, that your faith fail you not. Um, for the same reasons that you question how you can stand, speaks to the fact that you believe God's word and that's how you stand. Mm. Divorce, as pastor just alluded to, may not have been your choice. Uh, it's not an easy thing to go through, to think about, or even to come out of. Sometimes it's necessary. It is written in our Bible for a reason. Although at the church, we don't want to condone it. We definitely understand it. Faith, uh, divorce for a lot of times can be a faith walk, right? Uh, uh, because for how God has allowed things to process and to go into progress is necessary. How do we stand? Lean not to your own understanding, but believe in God, everything he said, and allow God to direct your path. Keep trusting him. Your situation does not define your heavenly destination. We just finished talking about sin and falling short. Here's the reality. Uh, Pastor Nancy talked about once saved, always saved. Some people have a problem with that. I don't. The blood of Jesus never loses his power. He's died for the sins of all men from Adam all down to the last soul born in this earth. Your, your faults are forgiven. Accept your forgiveness. Amen. Walk in it. Own it. Believe it. And stand. God will keep his word. Don't doubt that. He will not restrict from you what his promises are because you went through this divorce. I can promise you that. God is not that fickle. I take comfort in that answer for so many that I know and love, and I'm so grateful for your encouragement. Pastor Tyrone, I want to ask the same thing of you from a different perspective, and that is when we get divorced, and I don't, I've never been divorced, but I feel it because, I mean, it's 300 different people on average are impacted by divorce, a single divorce. And so I, I felt the, the stress and the burden of, of divorce when we go through divorce. That's why I'm gonna say that. Um, often the people that are affected, they feel a loss of self-value, self-worth. Um, they feel a sense of rejection. They struggle with abandonment. And, and how do we reclaim our self-worth when we saw it through somebody else's eyes for so long and they no longer uh, seem to place the same value on us? God so loved the world mm. that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever shall believe in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. God saw such a value in you, such value in you that he was willing to give of himself to retain you to him. The Bible talks about there's no temptation that overtakes us except that it's coming to man. But God is faithful who will not allow us to be tempted beyond what we are able to bear. God is faithful even in this situation of divorce. Yes, in the church, divorce is just the same as the world. The difference is, is that we have to make sure that we understand that even though someone may have, if you will, cast us aside, God still loves us. The divorce did not define you. God does. And mm. as long as God defines you, then you are worth something to him. Once again, God gave us a gift. Let us accept that gift from God because he truly loves us enough that while we are still in the midst of our problems, in the midst of our trials, the Bible says to us, lean not to our own understanding, but in all of our ways, acknowledge him. 
if we trust him with all our heart and all our mind and all our soul, we can then recognize that we are a value to God. God gave the birds and the, and the flowers something to wear and, and food to eat. He values you just as much. Mm, such a great answer, Pastor Edwards. And as you alluded to, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. I can't find a single perfect person other than Jesus himself in the entire Bible. I know if he forgave them, used the likes of David, and even ends up calling him a man after God's own heart, after Bathsheba, how much more is God capable of redeeming us and redeeming your situation and bringing love after loss? Well, uh, there's so many live questions coming, and I, I want to get to Elaine's question. Elaine, thank you. You're watching right now, and Pastor Nancy, she's asking, is it wrong to keep praying about something that you've already prayed for? Um, well, let me just say that Paul's command in 1 Thessalonians 5.17 says that we pray without ceasing. Now, that doesn't mean that we walk around with our head down and our eyes closed all day long um, and, and, you know, be in, in that kind of prayer. We, but yeah. the word, uh, the word is so important because it's God's promises. And if we, and this with this last question, we stand on the word. We stand firm on the word because God does not break his promises and God never leaves us nor forsakes us. And he hears every word. And then also come into agreement with someone else because the Bible also says that when you, uh, when two or more are gathered in his name, that he hears our prayers. So now I, I think it's okay to, to pray, but I think you also need to know um, whether your prayer is in accordance with the word of God, because you can pray until you're blue in the mm. face. But if it's not according to the word of God and it's not going to be his will, he knows the end from the beginning. He knows whether what you're praying for is going to benefit you or build you up or edify you. And God's got your back. So if it's something that you're praying for that is not supposed to be, God will shut that door and you need to rely on the Holy Spirit to let you know when to stop praying. That is such a defining principle right now to understand that what you're praying for is in the will of God, or at least to ask him while you're praying for that so ardently. Because you look at Israel, they pleaded with God for a king. They weren't intended to have one. You look at Abraham, who didn't believe that God was going to bring the promised child through Sarah, and it created all kinds of turmoil and conflict that we even see uh, affecting us today in our current climate and culture uh, because he slept with Hagar in proxy of Sarah, and that didn't work out. That wasn't God's intention. And sometimes we keep asking for it. We might get it. Uh, and that that was a, a good point you made too. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna pray with my head bowed and my eyes closed on my way home from the station this morning or this afternoon. <laughs> I'm gonna keep praying with my eyes open. Uh, the next question is from Chris. Why did Jesus ask John to take care of his mother when he had male siblings to take care of her? Interesting perspective and acknowledgement, uh, Dr. Booker. Thank you. Uh, let me jump right in there. Um, Jesus at the cross had uh, developed a relationship with John in such a way that he could trust John. And uh, it was about relationship. Sometimes your biological um, family uh, don't have the relationship with, with the Lord or even with you that uh, you can trust them. Uh, and so he left John in the uh, uh, John in the care of his mother, and he left uh, his mother. He he says, "Behold your son." And so it was about that relationship that the, he was. John was called the beloved disciple, and he 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 he, he could trust John, and that's why he did that. Mm, so good. I I wonder if the relationship was estranged. Uh, sometimes we have to read in between the lines. That's a, that's a great answer, uh, Dr. Person. And I wonder if they, because they thought, they didn't believe Jesus was the Son of God, did they think, hmm, mom picked a favorite, she's out of her mind, did they, was the relationship estranged? Or was Jesus just simply saying to us that 
you need to handle your affairs before you go. And he was giving us an example to look for, uh, saying, make sure the people that you're leaving behind are taken care of. Buy that life uh, insurance if you need to, if you've got kids at home. You know, uh, that's, uh, but one last question in, in 30 seconds or less, uh, Bishop Davenport, Joyce is asking, after the rapture, will there still be life on earth? Not only will there still be life on earth, there'll still be an opportunity through all the trials and tribulations for those who didn't know Jesus beforehand to get saved. The Bible says there's going to be a multitude saved during that period. There will absolutely still be life on earth. Yes. Yeah. Ooh, that was quick, to the point, succinct, and success. Uh, thank you so much, Bishop. I always love having you on the program with me. Listen, if you've been blessed by uh, today's program, you can partner with us and you can give on our website to www.tct.tv. You can call us at 1-800-232-9855, and you can scan that QR code right there on your screen for additional ways to donate. Also, we want to thank our power-packed panel of pastors and bishops and doctors. I tell you, we are blessed with an educated crew. They are an incredible blessing. I love being on with you. You're anointed. I want to thank you viewers uh, for tuning in, for being with us and receiving from the Lord an impartation that is truly, I know it has truly blessed your life because it's blessed my life today. And I want to encourage you to continue walking in your God-given assignment each day. Receive that daily bread. Don't wait from Sunday to Sunday to get the word in. Get it every day. God bless you today. This has been TCT, and I've been your host, Pastor Michael Gamble. God bless you. Ask the Pastor is a TCT Network production and is made possible by your financial gifts. If you have questions or comments, write Ask the Pastor, P.O. Box 1010, Marion, Illinois 62959, or email us at ask at tct.tv. Thanks for watching.